Coming up on this episode of Belief Hole. He got up and entered the living room only to encounter a man in a black hood with one arm around his wife's neck and the other holding a gun to her head. Quote, it was exactly what I had written. Makes you wonder if it's possible that in our reality, we can manifest these things or create these things through storytelling. Could we possibly be characters that are created by people just writing stories in some parallel reality? My life would be kind of boring. But that's how it's real, you know? Yeah, I guess so. You need filler characters. And... I'm alone a lot, so. <laughs> <laughs> the amount of crisis apparition sightings. So when someone you know is about to die and appearing in front of you or spectral ghost encounters, the amount of those have decreased in conjunction with the rise of television and the decrease of reading. A lot of accounts used to happen when people were reading a book. But that makes total sense because when you're watching television, you're in a trance state. It's so different from reading or being in the moment. Exactly, when you're watching TV, you're literally just absorbing. Right, it's interesting. Yeah, yeah. 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 The floor to his left just disappeared. He now saw, quote, a vast whirling mass of gases, all turning in a circular motion around new forming globes, burning like suns. Time had somehow looped back on itself. And this becomes something we see in a theme, even with Philip K. Dick having a very similar experience, looping back in time to his childhood home. Pretty fascinating. Yes. It's super weird. It's super weird. It's super weird. It's super weird. If you think of human beings as characters in their own story. Once you realize that your life is a story, you can start to try to attempt to start writing your own story in a pretty explicit esoteric sort of way where you can sort of bend the universe around you in ways to create your future narrative. Can we create a successful podcast? Yeah, let's do some sex magic. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> Volunteers, please. That's all right. Conspiracy, synchronicity, Sasquatch, homunculus, alien races, Satanism in Hollywood, MK Ultra, Tartaria. There's like a whole. I've been watching this one guy. Like, Close the door, in. jury. Close your door. What's the uh, inner earth disagreements? Ghost Dad. <laughs> I like that movie. Dogman, Bohemian Grove, Corey Feldman, Magicians are demons, Specters, Spirits, Spirit Sleep, Paralysis, Strange Disappearances, Sky Whale Phenomena, yes. Alternative History, Shadow People. Shh, quiet, I'm trying to say words with the mouth. It's getting dicey out there. Poltergeists. That's cool. Anunnaki. What is the moon? <laughs> Elf Towers. I would never talk about it. That's old. Y2K. Cover ups. Apocalyptic catastrophe. Vampire. Well, hello, hello. Well, hello. Hello, I'm John. I'm Chris. And I am Jeremy. And we've got a killer episode for you guys today. Hello, friends. Is that <laughs> that was supposed to be it? Who is that? He's just a man that I found on YouTube when he was talking about nootropics. <laughs> I like his voice. I know, it's funny. It has a kind of soft creepiness to it. Hello, friends. I wanted to play it right at the beginning, oh, like as, every, as we were coming in, but I missed it. I couldn't find the sound effect. Oh, that figures. After you took all the time loading. I know. But yesterday, I was like, oh, I got to put that at the beginning of the show because I just heard it randomly. <laughs> and then I tried to send it to myself, and uh -huh. I sent it to the wrong number, and someone texted back, what? <laughs> <laughs> That's hilarious, man. And I didn't even text them back. I was like, just just simmer on that. It'll be a mystery for them for a long time. Hello, friends. I like that. Well, that was good and worth it. <laughs> good. So today, today is going to be fun. It's a little different. This is going to be an exploration into some mind-bending stuff. Authors who have experiences with their own characters uh, in real life. Yeah. Which is a fascinating concept. And there's uh, several experiences we're going to get into about that. But also, in my research of that, I came across this incredible book, Mutants and Mystics, Science Fiction, Superhero Comics, and the Paranormal. This is a pretty epic. It's a tome, man. Yeah, it's, it's thick. I, I only had it a couple days before the show, so I'm not doing a huge deep dive into that, but I, I'm definitely utilizing it to talk about some of these incredible experiences that authors have that totally change their perception of reality. And then they use their art and their craft to get those ideas out there into pop culture. Right, but they don't tell people from the get-go, right, generally. Right. And some of the authors, they're going to be familiar to you. Philip K. Dick, obviously, we've talked about him on the show before. We're going to talk about him and his experiences 
obviously for the, any listeners who don't know Philip K. Dick, uh, Running Man, Blade Runner, Scanner Darkly, Scanner Darkly, Valis, which is going to play heavily into his paranormal experiences. He wasn't a fan of the Running Man film production, right? Was he? Well, that's the thing with authors in general. Usually, the movies it's a high bar to hit. Yeah, you know, I've never seen that movie. Running Man, I've heard of it a lot. Arnold, it's a classic for that kind of like eighties action sci-fi. It's not like Tron or Blade. It feels Bl- what? <laughs> not Blade. <sorry. laughs> <That's a Christian laughs> no vampires. I mean, it is a future society, dystopian future. Is it like Mad Max? Kind of, because there's a Thunderdome esque. I think it's prisoners, right, that are put into this scenario. It's like a gladiator situation where they have you have to fight each other and run. Yeah, he was the butcher of Bakersfield, I think, mm-hmm. Arnold Schwarzenegger's character. He supposedly could kill a lot of people. But no, I, I remember thinking that movie was good, but I'm sure if I'd written a book that was like really kind of in-depth and had a lot of uh, color and, and uh, mystique to it, and then it's an Arnold Schwarzenegger action flick, it probably with like <laughs> right. the flashy lights and the, you know, yeah. kind of hilarious moments, I, it would be hard to enjoy the film as the author of the book, I'm sure. It must have been post Conan the Barbarian. Conan, I think, is what started Arnold's career or was close to the beginning. That's a synchronicity because Conan the Barbarian, that's going to come into this episode because the artist of the original comic book series, at least the beginning run of the series, his name was Barry Windsor Smith, and he had some some of the most incredible paranormal experiences that I've ever read. Mind-altering, reality-changing. Um, Sober? Sober. He never did drugs. Really? So he yeah. wrote for, or he illustrated for Marvel. Was that it? Yeah. I'm interested to hear those stories. Yeah. I think you'll dig these, John. I think you can relate to these in some way because you've had some pretty existential, almost sort of Gnostic download. Yeah. I've had different periods in my life where I've definitely had strange experiences like that. They come in waves. Right. I haven't had them in a long time. You're blasted but... with information. Yeah. I need to see more UFOs. Wait, I, I think know. that's where it came from. Why did Running Man come up? Arnold Schwarzenegger. But why? Philip Kadick. But Stephen King wrote The Running Man. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Google that. And I was like, we just talked so long about that. We made that. that mistake before. I forget why I thought... Uh, that O face was hilarious. Oh, I should make a correction. On the Jin episode, we had a long conversation about angels and free will. And I mentioned in that episode that they didn't have free will. Yeah. Apparently, that's not as much of a common belief or thought as I thought. Yeah, because we were like, well, how would Lucifer rebel right. if they didn't have free will? Exactly. And then I Googled it after the fact. So I was like, I, you know, I usually double check facts before. But uh, that was <laughs> such like, I kind of, because I heard a whole lecture series from my friend Pat's college during COVID. He had to listen on Skype. Ruggers. Doing a road trip. And so I was sucked into this, you know, whole conversation debate. And I double checked with Pat. But then I Googled it after the fact just to double, double check And it was a lot of people answering, no, they have free will. It's a misinterpretation. So if you listen to us, I sounded pretty sure about it. Uh, I'm not so sure anymore. But it sounds like there's some room for interpretation. Yeah, I mean, there's always that. But I do think I was in the minority. I mean, when you're looking through the lens of academia and certain niche schools of philosophy, Mm -hmm. who knows what the arguments are, you know, and who knows what the top conversations are about that. You can look them up and apparently that's one uh, detail that I kind of took as a foregone conclusion just because of the experience I had uh, with Angels. (laughs) Angels. <laughs> with that class that Jeremy's I heard. personal experience. Yeah, my conversations with angels. Um, okay. Regarding your question on angels and free will, I can tell you the Catholic position on that. No idea about Protestant belief on it. Angels have free will when they are created, and at the moment of creation, they are fully aware of reality of God, Satan, etc., and they make their choice right there and then whether to follow God or resist him. Oh, that's interesting. They make it as soon as they're created? I guess so. And the choice is final. There is no chance for repentance as redemption as there is for humans. That's interesting. That that comes from Justin, a listener of ours on CastBox, but echoes a lot of what I read online after the fact. That just seems like a total guess, though. I mean, how could anyone know that? I mean, know that piece of information. Yeah. I mean, a lot of it comes from tradition, depending on what belief system. Right. I get that. But there's no way to corroborate that at all. I don't know, dude. (laughs) <laughs> we could get John D in here, get his holy table. Is that what it's called? Contact the angels. I'm not saying it's wrong. I just, I just think that, I mean, I guess at some point if God, you know, put that in someone's mind or something. <laughs> Hello, John. This is the truth. I listened to your podcast. Maybe it I'm was. concerned about the accuracy. I mean, that's kind of what we're talking kind about today. A strange way to do it. They're just created. They're like, pick. Are they just created out of nowhere? Like now? Like they're still being, is it like a factory that's yeah, just popping out? Are, are angels still in production? Yeah, I was under the impression that it was like kind of a final of, pressing. Yeah, I thought the, the angels broken. were like all the, I mean, I don't know, but if I were God, that's how I would do it. Make mm. them limited edition. <laughs> I guess he could have restarted after we lost communication through 
prophets and things and direct angel communication. So yeah, no, so you well, start it back up. To bring it back to today's episode. Yeah, sorry. That was a bit of a tangent. You're talking about knowledge being, you know, just given to someone like that. And mm-hmm. that's a lot, it's sort of a, a big piece of what today's episode is about. Some of these authors that had experiences where they were given this gnosis or knowing by some alien or supernatural or godly entity that was far beyond their uh, ability to understand. I like Vallis. Vallis, exactly. That's Philip, Philip K. Dick. Philip K. Dick. Who and, did not write The Running Man. Right, yes. Uh, <laughs> he did write Vallis, though. And Vallis was a book based on an experience that he had in real life. It was sort of autobiographical, where he saw this thing and it beamed pink light into his face. And he downloaded all of this information. We'll get to the, more of the details of that towards the end of the episode. But it basically made him realize that all of his works that he had done were building up to Vallis. And what Vallis allowed him to do was decode all of his previous books and see how they were part of a reality that's just outside of this understanding of reality. So he was given some kind of divine insight from this other source. Yeah, that, and, we'll, and we'll see okay. correlations between these authors of their experiences, not only from how they received information, but also the paranormal occurrences that happened like slipping back through time and giving themselves information in the past. Like it gets pretty out there. So you said that this experience let him see how his earlier works were inspired? Yeah. And that those earlier works were... Not actually fiction. Right. Right. Okay. They were, and I believe Philip K. Dick, I didn't get to this in the book. If it's in the book, it probably is. But I know Philip K. Dick talked about how these books that he had written, not The Running Man, but other books, uh, a lot dystopian like that, but they're visions of other realities that do exist or will exist. And it's all part of this mosaic of reality. But we'll get into that. But I want to start with just some fun examples of authors and artists who see their own creations in real life. I thought we would start that way and then get into more of the paranormal experiences that authors had that were more of this transcendental experience that changed their view of reality. Awesome, yeah. So authors being visited by their own characters, creations, a real almost Tulpa-esque version, right? Mm -hmm. That and then also getting into the idea of downloading of divine information, in a sense, to present to the yeah. world. And let, let me start this off by saying... Um, supernatural information. Yeah. Not necessarily divine. Right. So to kick it off, I had just written this question. What power might we have to conjure our own creations from the void? Is it possible to even inadvertently focus so much energy and attention on an idea or an image that we draw it forth from the darkness of a nameless space and into a coffee shop or a gas station on our daily route? Yes. Yes. As we begin to see the threads at the edges of our own reality split and show the fraying, it conjures questions about existence itself. Could the tales of writers and creators running into their own creations be just a small footnote within the pages of a compendium of collected high strangeness stories that all point to a staggering truth about life itself? You wrote that? I wrote that. That was a question today. Well, thanks. I will cut out that compliment. But that's the question of today. <laughs> you cut it out? That's good. <laughs> that's a great question. I was just going to say, before we get into the first account, I wanted to give you a, a quick quote from Jeffrey J. Kripal, who wrote this book, Mutants and Mystics. And to give you a quick background on him, Professor Rice University, Houston, where we've been. Oh, yeah. Beautiful campus. He's the J. Newton Razor Chair in Philosophy and Religious Thought. I mean, he knows what he's doing. He's a pretty brilliant dude, and he's got some really revolutionary ideas, I think. He ain't no geek off the street. He ain't no geek off the street. Does somebody want to read this short quote by him? I would say, though, that the main project for me now is the renewal and revisioning of the comparative method for the study of religion. I want to help write it into existence, a new comparativism, one that can take what has been taken off the academic table over the last few decades, the sacred, the supernatural, the miraculous, the magical, or what I call simply the impossible, and put it back on the table again. Not to return us to the beliefs or simplistic rationalisms of the past, but to re-enchant the field and make it magical and miraculous again. Damn right. The discipline too often operates today as if all truths must be depressing, must somehow always be bad news. I don't buy that. That feels like an ideology, not a viable philosophical position. Interesting, yeah. So I think we can relate to his perspective on this and an admirable effort, I would yeah. say. Infusing magic back into reality a little bit. Mm-hmm. Like the wonder, why not? 
Why? Maybe. Exactly. We all need a little more Goonies in our life. Absolutely, Absolutely. John. <laughs> it's a great tagline. Uh, it's our time in the studio. It's our time in here. <laughs> In the belief um, hole. So no, I thought, you know, and we'll get more into his book in a moment, but I thought we would start with Alan Moore's experience. Oh, yeah. With his creation, Constantine, um, who you're all familiar with. If you haven't read the comic books, uh, the Keanu Reeves film, or the Keanu Reeves stars in Constantine. So Alan Moore, he did, uh, what, The Watchmen, mm-hmm. V for Vendetta. He did uh, Batman, The Killing Joke, a bunch of other stuff. Some of the darker, more intense comics. It would seem from a comic layman like myself. Yeah. And after we read his account, I'm going to kind of touch on that and why he started to get into magic. Alan Moore is really respected in the comic book field. He's considered one of the top, maybe the top comic writer. Really? He's kind of a iconoclast. Is that the word that popped in my head? What does that mean? Iconoclast? Like kind of a controversial figure? For sure. Okay. A person who attacks cherished beliefs or institutions. Destroyer of images used in religious worship. I, okay. I don't know if I meant that specifically, <laughs> but just remember him being kind of a um, definitely esoteric I guess you probably know a little bit about him from, from mm-hmm. researching this topic, but yeah, I mean, his, his work is pretty extraordinary when it comes to infusing magical concepts and esoteric concepts in a cult, meaning hidden concepts into pop culture. Alan Moore looks like a wizard. He is. <laughs> Look at that picture of him. I know, dude. Yeah. Jeffrey Kripal, who wrote this book, he refers to Alan Moore and some of these other authors as modern day magus or magicians, basically, because they really do practice some occult arts, some magic, and intertwine some of their theology or um, philosophy into their their art. But let's let's do this quick account here of his run in with Constantine because this is pretty cool. Some of you might be familiar with the story. This comes from Annotated DC. I have an idea that most of the mystics in comics are generally older people, very austere, very proper, very middle class in a lot of ways. They are not at all functional on the street. It struck me that it might be interesting for once to do an almost blue-collar warlock. Somebody who was streetwise, working class, and from a different background than the standard run of comic book mystics. Constantine started to grow out of that. One interesting anecdote that I should point out is that one day I was in Westminster in London. This was after we had introduced the character and I was sitting in a sandwich bar. All of a sudden, up the stairs came John Constantine. He was wearing the trench coat, a shortcut. He looked exactly like John Constantine. He looked at me, stared me right in the eyes, smiled, nodded, almost conspiratorially, and then just walked off around the corner to the other part of the snack bar. I sat there and thought, should I go around that corner and see if he's really there? Or should I just eat my sandwich and leave? I opted for the latter. I thought it was the safest. I'm not making any claims to anything. I'm just saying that it happened. Strange little story. Is it kind of interesting? Yeah. I mean, that could definitely just be this guy looked like the character I envisioned in my head. Right. I mean, you're an author, you have a very specific vision of what this person looks like probably so mm-hmm. it would probably be very unsettling to see someone that fit that to a T right John Constantine is a character of his yeah he's like a blue collar exorcist but he could deal with demonic entities and remove them from people and he could actually go into hell and speak with demons or battle them yeah did you ever see the movie no it was pretty good can't go wrong with Keanu yeah I just thought an interesting account there you was know a- Keanu Reeves what you know Keanu Reeves <laughs> Matrix <laughs> what <laughs> wait, wait what, what? <laughs> whoa no. That's what it is. No. I always forgot that quote when at the end with the Matrix, mm-hmm. he puts his hands up. Is it no that he says and stops the bullets? Or he says, wait. Is it wait? He goes, wait, what? what? And the bullets just fall. <laughs> <laughs> no way. <laughs> <laughs> That's right afterwards. He's great. He's great. He's a good guy. Everyone too, it seems likes like. Yeah. He just seems like a nice fellow. Like I heard that story about him. Someone knocks over his motorcycle by backing up their car. Oh, I saw that clip. Yeah. Yeah. And he's like, it's, it's okay. And he like helps someone with their car. I don't know, he does a lot of helping road stuff. <laughs> he did this thing where like every time he would take a picture with a woman, he'd have his hand. In oh, the not picture. touching. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, just so they, he couldn't get any like bad yeah. press. Sucks. You got to do that now. I mean, I understand it, but yeah. I'm sure you're a target. I mean, at that oh, point, you sure, so easily yeah. be like, you know. Yeah. Just random people you don't know coming up to you in the middle of the, you know, everything that was going on. Yeah. So he just keeps his hand far away in the picture so you can see what he's doing. Smart. Maybe he's just, it's because he's not a material being. He's ethereal. That's, That's probably what it is. Constantly time traveling. No longer needs a phone Constantly booth. Constantine. <laughs> Constantly Constantine. <laughs> That's a memoir. <laughs> All right. Sorry, Chris. You may continue. 
uh, that's okay. Speaking of uh, material and immaterial beings, let's talk a little bit about uh, Alan Moore. You know, we just read his account there. Like you said, who knows? Maybe, maybe not, right? It's definitely an out there idea. Probably though. But when you start to get into some of the stuff that he practices, and it definitely seems like it could be more possible to have an experience like this, whether it's a hallucination or a real experience or a combination, yeah. which is sort of a theme in this book. Well, yeah, I like that idea of playing with reality a little bit, you know? Because, mm-hmm. I mean, absolutely, we are components of this reality to fully understand the mechanism of how it is created or works. So yeah. why not consider those ideas? Yeah, and Kripal talks a lot about the idea of the paranormal writing us, writing the paranormal. What do you mean by that? So I think what he means by that is we write these paranormal stories, but the paranormal reality that we live in or that we share with paranormal phenomena writes us as well as in, if you think of human beings as characters in their own story, right? We all have these stories that we live. Once you realize that your life is a story and that you are being written or you are being created, you can start to try to attempt to start writing your own story in a pretty explicit esoteric sort of way (laughs) where you can start to bring things into existence or you can start to really sort of bend the universe around you in ways to create your future narrative. Can we create a successful podcast? Yeah, let's do some sex magic. (laughs) 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 Volunteers, please. Uh, This sounds like the secret. It does have a lot of that kind of... Or who's our guy? Dr. Wayne Dyer? God rest his soul? Yeah, like power of intention. Power of intention, Mm -hmm. yeah. What's the next plank line? Well, the, I guess uh, Dr. Wayne Dyer's interpretation of that, when you change the way you look at things, the things, the things, things you, you look, look at, at change. change. Yeah. yeah, I mean, if you look at this subatomic level, the quarks change when you look at them. Right, right. Which is what I think that's based off of. Do you expect them to be somewhere they they will be kind yeah, of idea? I'm not sure which particle. It might be the quarks, but yeah, you're it right. It is the quarks. Is it the quarks? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, but I, that's I mean, so obvious too. I mean, that's like in practice, you know, those experiments they did when people look at people from behind. Oh, right. That's the morphic field, right? Is mm-hmm. that what that yeah. is? I mean, that's a kind of a rudimentary, you know. Well, you know, you almost know it innately. Yeah. But it's weird that we talked about that in the animal telepathy ESP episode where but the police officers, you said, in, I don't know if it's in every manual or it was in this one manual, that you're trained if you're following someone not to stare at the back of their head. Right. Because they'll feel it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's that crazy. Field. Yeah. yeah. You're basically vibrating the corks in the back of their hair <laughs> and then they feel it. Uh, this is just a little thing that happened yesterday with Jay because I feel like we're connected. Mm-hmm. First time I left, I had this intense sensation that we were now psychically connected. But something happened yesterday where he was over at mom and dad's and, uh, I texted her. I said, I'll be over in a few minutes. As soon as she got the text, he ran to the door. Oh, that's crazy. Like he knew it was time that I was coming back. Yeah. Well, when we covered that, when we did our Morphic Fields Animal ESP episode, yeah, there so many. Just, it's so interesting. Well, it, I literally saw that when I watched Jake the other night when you came back early. Remember, you were going to oh, stay yeah. at the hotel uh-huh. and you decided to come back. Yeah. You called me to let me know. Uh-huh. And, and I was with Jake in the car. We got home. And then it was probably like, a minute or two minutes before you got there, I didn't say anything to Jake. I didn't give him any cues like, hey, daddy's coming home. Right. And I was like, oh, John's probably right around the corner because I knew you were heading back. And he left the kitchen suddenly, like he heard something, went to the front door. You weren't there. No one was there. And then like a minute and a half, two minutes later, you pulled in. Hmm. Yeah. Remember yeah. in Rupert Sheldrake's work when he was covering the Warfield Field stuff? That's exactly the, some of the examples that he used mm-hmm. in his experiments. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. That was exactly the experiments, mm-hmm. the same things. It reminds me of, I mean, there could be things, obviously, like, you know, birds or, or migration patterns following the magnetic patterns of, of the earth, for instance. Magnetic the, fields and could be a sensory. I mean, we think of it as magical or supernatural, but it could be a bond that is, yeah, it just, just builds up a magnetism between it's you just two. It's the a sense. science that hasn't been fully explored. Right. right. And that's what paranormal is, right? I mean, it's what seems like magic until you can break down the scientific explanations. Well, Arthur C. Clarke, is that what he said? Any advanced civilization, sufficiently advanced enough, their science would seem like magic to us. Oh, look at these iPhones. I mean, I'm still like amazed by that. Oh, yeah. Can you imagine a <laughs> hundred years ago show? They would be Total like, magic. that is absolute. There's no way that there's nothing. Yeah. But that just has to be magic because, I mean, the, what we can do with these things is totally mind-blowing. Well, think think yeah. of even the telephone, like the landline. When, when we did our phone calls from the dead episode, it started to become sort of this cross-technological platform where mediums and things would start to think, how can I use the telephone? Because right. you know, there are these disembodied voices that are traveling thousands of miles at almost an instant. Mm-hmm. Like it's magic, you know? Yeah, it's running through the ether in a sense. feels like it should operate within the space of where spirits dwell. Yeah. But it's a, sci- it's a science, but it just feels like it has a 
otherworldly or at least uh, non-physical, you know. Paranormal and science are interchangeable depending on what you know. Right. Weird. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, absolutely. They, I mean, all paranormal things become science if you understand them. If you get to that point, if you yeah. if you can And I think it. that we talked about this before. That's I think the difference of the term supernatural in some ways of looking at it, where right. I think that's more of sort of a mystical beyond experience the or that's just beyond human comprehension that might never be uh, comprehended by the human mind anyway, at least right. in this form. But there still probably has to be some like Yeah, it's just outside of- Yeah, right, you know. exactly. It's probably just, it's outside of our ability to understand. Is there anything though that's just, there's no, it's impossible. The mind of God. Yeah, maybe. I guess so. Yeah, you'd never be able to dissect that. Yeah. That quote from Arthur C. Clarke was, any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. Right, I remember that. Okay, we'll take a quick break in a moment. Uh, before we do, I just wanted to kind of put a little icing on the Alan Moore cake here. Mm -hmm. uh, mm, and just do a quick... Um, Alan Moore cake. <laughs> <laughs> Alan, more cake! <laughs> <laughs> weird, we're weird people. Um, I just grabbed a quick bit because I've, I've heard his account, this Constantine account before on blogs and things like that. But what I like about... Kripal's work is that he pulls in some of the information that's a little deeper on, on his experience. Who is Al Moore? What experiences he had that might give you an idea of why something like this might occur in his, in his life? So Alan Moore, we talked about him, you know, the, the work that he's done. And you're right when you mentioned he's sort of an iconoclast. With uh, Watchmen, he sort of had this deconstruction of, of the comic book genre in, in general. It was dark, like you were talking about, very dark. But for him, it re represented the symbolic end of this period of creativity for him. And he said, quote, it was a coming to a limit of what I could further understand about my writing rationally. This was no longer enough. I felt I had to take a step beyond the rational and magic was the only area that offered floorboards after that step. It was a life-changing origins event, a full-blown magical experience that I could not really account for. And this account, this experience that he had has a date. It's January 7th, 1994, when he has this oh, experience. Mom's birthday. Mom's birthday, yes. And your mom graduated, plays a big role in today's episode because- <laughs> Mom, <laughs> 19, out of our 1973 show. was a- Alan Moore, our dad? <laughs> <laughs> All that sex magic. Um, 1973, <laughs> we'll, we'll get to why 1973 is a pretty miraculous year for reality and science fiction combining. So this event on January 7th, 1994, and this comes from Mutants and Mystics, Moore speaks openly about his use of psychedelics, especially magic mushrooms, and describes a number of scenes in conjunction with the 1994 occult opening, including spending part of an evening talking to an entity who claimed to be a goetic demon, first mentioned in the Apocrypha. Moore would later weave goetic demons into his work, Promethea. What is a goetic demon? That's a good question. Someone look that up. I'm looking up. You don't know? <laughs> That's why I did. Kind of a researcher. Oh, that was my note to look up, and I forgot. Um, so again, that was an example of him bringing in the paranormal experiences into his work. He struggled over whether the demon was purely internal, that is, a projection of his psyche, or whether it was external, and more or less what it claimed to be. In the fantastic paradox pattern that will structure all that follows, Moore confesses that the most satisfying answer is that it was both. And this goes to what you were talking about, Jeremy. Quote, that doesn't make any logical sense, but that satisfied me most emotionally. It feels truest, meaning that it is both real and unreal. You hear that a lot. That is unsatisfying to me. <laughs> well, it satisfied him. Yeah, I don't um, care. Well, again, it goes back to the idea of the paranormal writing us, writing the paranormal. It's this sort of constant, the snake that eats itself sort it's like of idea. like the demon that is in himself. Yeah, but it's also sort of he's created the demon but yet the demon does exist. So it seems like the a goetic oh, demon. Oh, I see what you're saying. A goetic demon is simply a demon that's named in the uh, the Lesser Key of Solomon, which is a grimoire, which magic is a book. a book of magic, essentially written in the mid 17th century from materials compiled from a couple centuries older. It's divided into five books, the Ars Goetica, etc. So basically it's from a grimoire, which would be a fascinating episode, I think, to do would be an episode on grimoires, books of magic throughout time that supposedly allow you to communicate with the other side or with demons or whatever. That sounds fascinating to me. Absolutely. Not just a way to condone it, obviously, but just the alleged stories of rituals gone wrong, what, the, the consequences of what can happen if you, you know, are trying to attempt these things. Dabble in the undabbleable. In the undabbleable. <laughs> <laughs> That's going to be a trending key term, I'm sure, on Google. <laughs> to dabble in the undabbleable bubble. Let's take a quick break. When we come back, we're going to do one more account of an author experiencing one of his own creations 
involving a monkey man, Planet of the Apes style. <gasps> and then we're going to do a quick look at the artist of Conan and the Barbarian, his mind bending experience and, and tie it off with Philip K. Dick and see if we can dig into some of his truly bizarre experiences. That's synchronicity because we're going to run into a couple of monkey mermaids in the expansion episode. All right. What's the expansion episode? Well, let me tell you before the break, <laughs> the expansion episode, we're getting into the murky brine. Nice. Of the deep, dark seas. Some of the magic and mystery there. And specifically, we actually had a request from Party Shrimp uh, to do mermaids. And synchronistically, I just watched The Lighthouse, which is a freaky, that was great. disturbing movie. We'll probably talk about that a little bit in the expansion. Yeah. But yeah, we're going to get into some of the, um, the strange reality to the mermaid phenomenon. It's a cross-cultural, global reality from antiquity. Are mermaids freaky? Why are you saying reality? It's a reality in the sense that they were a real concept okay. throughout time. Yeah. Are they real? Maybe. No, I said freaky. So these are not friendly things? Well, we're going to get into that as well. Uh, there are attributes where they are, depending on what tradition, what encounter, even modern encounters, uh, they can be, they're either horrifying, they can help sailors, or they can drag them to their deaths. Uh, they are either divinely created or they're their own race of merfolk. The siren. Like Ariel? Ariel, man. And that's fascinating too. The original Hans Christian Andersen story. Pretty dark. Very different and fair, the, fairly the dark. version? Yeah. And we'll get into that into the expansion as well because cool. that's interesting. Definitely uh, check out this clip we're going to play of the expansion. If you're interested, you want to get double episodes. Every time we drop an episode, sign up for the expansion, only five bucks a month and you get double the loving. Dabble in the undabbleable. There you go. <laughs> we'll be back. really going at it for this potential mermaid reality. I want them to be real. <laughs> I want I want an Ariel. Ariel to find the prince. I want Ariel to find me. <laughs> That's true. I want to be the prince. Would you guys, would you think you would date a, mer a mermaid if, I mean, considering all the if she got her pieces legs? and parts? No, I mean with the tail. How do you date a mermaid? Where would you go? You, you, cart you <laughs> cart her around in a tub. <laughs> you have to be a sailor <laughs> or a lighthouse keeper. Sounds kind of romantic to be just out at sea, like together. Yeah. I don't know if I could commit though. Yeah, it's going to be, I mean, it's going to have to be a long distance relationship for the most part, right? You're not going to be, she's not going to be You could jog inside. along the canal. No, you'd have to live like on a boat or something. You could work out together, just jog along the canal on the towpath. And she could just you'd swim be friends along. with Megorius? Yes. Megorius the Grand. There is a Megorius character in here. Oh, I cannot wait for him. All right, let's get through so we can get to that guy. All right. Tell us an account about this chair. Okay, so the local people in this area... This area is called the Clean Karoo or Klein Karoo, I believe, South Africa's semi arid central region. They describe a beautiful woman with blue eyes, pink cheeks, and a fishtail seen sitting at deep mountain pools combing her long black hair. And this is a feature too this kind of kelp like, seaweed like, but beautiful dark hair. That's a common theme across cultures with the mermaid. But another theme is that they often pull you in to drown you. That's the dark mermaid, yeah, merfolk, for whatever reason. And we've covered this in previous encounters of things in the woods, the lore, and I think in the, in the Americas, of these things living alongside the waters that are calling to you, pretending to be someone you know, that disembodied voice. Right. Or just pretending to be a woman hurt or an old lady that needs help. And then when you go to help her across the river or whatever, they overpower you and drown you. Yeah, the it's, a weird, it's a weird theme that exists throughout. And it could be a warning story, stay away from water, you know, um, or it could be real. If you enjoyed that clip, head over to beliefhole.com and hit the expansion button to get access to all of our extra episodes. And we're back. We are certainly back for more of the good stuff. Yes, more good stuff indeed, John. We're going to be jumping into one more account of, uh, and this one is probably one of the coolest or one of the most, I guess, action-packed. Oh, action-packed. Come back to the running, man. <laughs> Don't bring that up. Okay, and it's interesting because I've seen this, like the Constantine account, I've seen this on blogs and stuff, the story. But uh, it's funny, Jeffrey Kripal, the guy who wrote this book, I think this is where the blogs found this story originally. Oh, from uh, the when this started populating on the internet, I think it came initially from uh, Mutants and Mystics by Jeffrey Kripal because he discusses how he sat down with him mm -hmm. to talk about his strange experiences and the paranormal relating to his art. And before I tell the story, I just wanted to relay 
what Kripal's purpose was behind writing this book, and that'll take us right into this account here. Cool. Quote, I want to take this project two steps further by showing how these modern mythologies can be fruitfully read as cultural transformations of real-life paranormal experiences and how there is no way to disentangle the very public pop culture products from the very private paranormal experiences. And that, I want to suggest, is precisely what makes them fantastic. There is another way to say all this. It appears that the paranormal often needs the pop culture form to appear at all. The truth needs the trick, the fact, the fantastic. And this is where we get into the last account I wanted to tell. Consider how back in the late 1970s, the prolific comic book writer, Doug Monch, found himself writing out the real in a work of fantasy a few seconds before it became the real, in fact. I sat down with Doug in the spring of 2009. Here is the story he told me. Monch had just finished writing a scene for a Planet of the Apes comic book about a black hooded gorilla named Brutus. The scene involved Brutus invading the human hero's home, where he grabbed the man's mate by the neck and held a gun to her head in order to manipulate the hero. Just as Doug finished the scene, he heard his wife call for him in an odd sort of way from the living room across the house. Dog. He got up, walked the length of the house, and entered the living room only to encounter a man in a black hood with one arm around his wife's neck and the other holding a gun to her head. Quote, it was exactly what I had written. It was so, so immediate in relation to writing and such an exact duplicate of what I had written that it became an instant altered state. The air in the room congealed, became almost like fog, and yet, paradoxically, I could see with greater clarity. I could see the individual threads of his black hood. Doug's emotional response to this series of events was a very understandable and natural one. He became obsessed with the black-hooded intruder for months, then years. More immediately, he found it very difficult to write. So terrified was he of that eerie connection between what he might write and what might happen. Quote, it really does make you wonder. Are you seeing the future? Are you creating a reality? Should you give up writing forever after something like this happens? I don't know. Sounds like Marianne. Oh, yeah, that, and that's a creepy show. Yeah. Oh, disturbing. Oh, Netflix. The first Marianne, like the old lady. Mm -hmm. Oh my gosh. Was there another Marianne? Well, she wasn't actually Marianne, that old woman. She was possessed. Oh, right. Okay. This is a Netflix show John's yeah. talking about. Italian, I think. Really good. I think it's French, maybe. French? Is yeah, it French? I'm pretty sure. Yeah, that sounds right. Yeah, it's super duper creepy. And uh, definitely watch it without the subtitles. Or without the American. Oh, yeah. I, I did not like it when, with the overdubs, it was yeah. like, oh, this is horrible. It most often ruins, I feel like, Yeah, it show. totally ruined it. Yeah. But with the subtitles, it's awesome. And uh, the story is like, there's this young girl writer, and she's basically, to satisfy this demon, she has to write. Keeps it in yeah. existence, yeah. kind of, right? This witch. It keeps it in existence, but then when she writes, it ends up killing a bunch of people. But if she doesn't, it just tortures her and yeah. tortures everyone around and her. her family, all her loved ones. Yeah, so it's this weird... Back and forth. Good show. It's dark, but there's humor in there too. But it's it's well, it's shot well. Yeah, and it's it's super creepy. If you want to watch a similar idea that's a little less dark, uh, Will Ferrell in Stranger Than Fiction. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's same, a great movie. Same kind of concept. Maybe like a little after wash after you watch Marianne. Yeah, because <laughs> it does. That Marianne does kind of stick with you. I mean, different concept of Stranger, well, Stranger Than Fiction. Fiction was still kind of yeah, that was kind of heavy. Oh, it was, yeah. It had some emotional yeah. aspects to it. But um, not, maybe not. Maybe uh, <laughs> we'll watch a little reality television after. There you go. But it does make you wonder, like, you hear a story like that and thinking about Stranger Than Fiction, but you hear a story like Doug's experience here with his Planet of the Apes character created, makes you wonder if it's possible that in our reality we can manifest these things or create these things through storytelling. Is it possible that, I don't know, this is totally speculation, totally out there idea, but could we be creations of some something else? Well, I guess we are. Oh, yeah. You could look at it that way through any ancient religion or or contemporary newer new age religion. Or even the religion of simulation theory. But even further out there idea, could we possibly be characters that are created by people just writing stories in some parallel reality? Well, my life would be kind of boring. That's what you hear a lot from people, yeah. But that's I mean, how it's real. You know? Yeah, I guess so. You need filler characters. And I'm alone a lot, so. <laughs> <laughs> You'd be like, he's sitting Me at too. home again. <laughs> it's a character that doesn't just, you don't get a lot of play, a lot of attention in the plot, so you're it's doing true. a lot of busy but work. Back to his his account, it would make you think, should I keep doing this? Yeah, Like, totally. is there, are there real consequences I to this? I feel like I've heard of this phenomenon before, like the writing in, mm -hmm. into existence. 
it's a trope that comes up a lot in fiction. There's the yeah. tulpa idea. You have the golem, which is like a old Judaic idea. It comes from, I think, the, the Talmud. That would be an interesting one to do to talk about at some point, tulpas and golems. Mm-hmm. Golems are basically a created creature made from, I want to say, mud. Yeah. That is given life. And in most stories with the golem, it doesn't want to be relieved of its existence, I guess you could say. So there's usually an issue. Like if you create a golem, be careful because it may do your bidding, but you can't necessarily stop it after that. It's like once it's created, you can't put it to bed. Yeah, it does, it's like Frankenstein kind of in a way. It doesn't want to give up its, you know. Yeah. Tulpas are a lot like that. Tulpas are thought forms though, right? Mm-hmm. They're created because of either thought mass consciousness or intent, but then they can come visit you or happen in reality. It's kind of Jungian in a way. Well, it sounds like it. Theosophy adapted the idea from, I want to say it was a, Buddhist concept, the thought form, but theosophists adapted it for theosophy and this idea of the emanation body. But yeah, the idea that you you create something. And we one day we will do more of a focus on tulpas. There was one woman, Alexandra David Neal, who claimed to have witnessed the creation and actually had some success on her own while she was in Tibet. Um, but that's a whole other thing we can get into. What did she sometime. create? Hold on. I feel like the last story didn't get finished. What happened to the wife and the intruder? Exactly. I heard the story before too and I was like, did he just leave? I mean, it seemed like there was some sort of, you know, powerful energy in the room. Right. Did he telekinesis to go leave or right. what happened? Or did he pass out and wake up and it didn't happen? Like what? Yeah. So the, the guy intruder, just to revisit it, had his arm around his wife, right? The gun to her head. And the gun to her head and arm around her. Yeah. It was gun head head. Was yeah. there, did it explain the story how that situation resolved? Because that is See, that's, that's when I was, it was surprising because in blogs where that story had been copied from his book, uh, they never included that. But I always assumed if you could find it anywhere that there would be more information on that. But in reading his book, I didn't see an end to that. Then again, I didn't read every page because it's 400 pages. I had two days. He might have gone more into that, but I don't think. I don't think that when Monch gave his account, he mentioned what happened at least it wasn't relayed in Mutants and Mystics. Maybe something bad happened. At the, the well, the impression I got Definitely was that possible. the guy ran away or left. Yeah, I mean, that's kind of... Because he does say like the fact that he thought about this intruder for so long. Right. Also, if it's like a, a cloaked mysterious figure, maybe monkey, maybe human, if it had been arrested, <laughs> it would have been, you know, national news. No, I didn't think it was a monkey figure. Oh, so it was a part ape? I think it just said he was had a... Intruder. Like a hood over his Yeah. Head. Yeah, I don't think he saw the face, but he, he was writing... The story Pretty sure was, it wasn't a monkey. Right. Well, the, the story he was writing, it was a Planet of the Apes comic book. Right. I mean, it could have been some sort of foreshadowing or he felt it if he's writing it at the exact moment. You know, we talk about mm-hmm. this, you know, if you're really close to someone, you may be able to sort of foreshadow what's coming. Right. And that's definitely possible. You're so zoned into, maybe you're picking up something yeah. that's happening Especially externally. if you're writing, which is, can be very like... You know, in the flow state. Yeah, Yeah, and I I won't get into this, but I'll just mention real quick, there was a really interesting article I came across when researching for this episode about how the amount of crisis apparition sightings, so when someone you know is about to die Mm -hmm. and appearing in front of you, or spectral ghost encounters, the amount of those have decreased in conjunction with the rise of television and the decrease of reading. A lot of accounts used to happen when people were reading a book and being zoned in. That's fascinating. What if that's intentional? It might be. But that makes total sense because when you're watching television in a screen- Totally zoned out. It's like you're in a trance state. That's mm-hmm. It's so different from reading or just like being in the moment. Yeah. When I take breaks from the phone, I notice that a lot. It's like I have daydreams and I just feel like more connected to well, and when actual you're, life. And when you're reading, you're creating a reality in your mind. Mm-hmm. You know, So your mind is doing a lot, working a lot, but you're using different parts of your brain you normally use. When yeah, you're, you're watching TV- state. You're using yeah, your imagination. Exactly. And, when you're watching TV, you're literally just absorbing. Right. You know, for the most part. But yeah, I thought that was a fascinating account to bring up. It's super weird. Yeah. And I was just interested to see how it ended. <laughs> that, yeah. That will be left up to the reader. Maybe you should finish your stories, Monch. Doug Monch. <laughs> Maybe we'll hear from Kripal. Maybe he'll let us know. Kripal and Munch. Kripal and Munch at law. <laughs> <laughs> That's right, that Detective Munch. As you're thinking Munch, yeah. Okay, so with that, we're going to move into the last two people I wanted to focus on here who were brilliant, especially Dick. Philip K. But let's start with Barry Windsor Smith. And this, uh, this section in Kripal's book is called Beneath the Pages, and you'll see why. It's very kind of literal. So this is kind of a cool story. So Kripal is in Jack Vallée's library in 2008. Jack Vallée, we've talked about, he did Passport to Magnolia, which argues that UFO encounters look a lot like traditional folklore. 
Mm -hmm. in comparative mystical literature, which is sort of Kripal's focus, comparative stuff. But he hands Kripal this book and he says, you might find this interesting. And he was because he recognized the author immediately. He said it was one of his heroes because he grew up reading Conan the Barbarian. And this book was called Opus and it was all about the incredible mind-bending, reality-shifting experiences he had while he was doing Conan the Barbarian. That's interesting. And previous, um, involving time fallbacks to his childhood. I want to do a couple of those accounts here before we get into Dick. Oh, that sounds weird. <laughs> All righty. John, do you want to be... Uh, yes. Barry. You'll be Barry, okay? You're going to be the illustrator who did Conan. In the spring of 1970, Barry Smith was in his parents' home in East London, where he drew the first nine issues of Conan. He was working hard to make yet another Marvel deadline. He guesses it was early May. In any case, it was 1.30 or so in the afternoon. As one part of his attention was focused on the art, another part looked toward the window. Standing in front of the bright sunlit window, he saw a tall man with a mustache chatting with a woman to his right. They're gonna love it, the man said, and then the woman left. Oh yeah. And then Barry Smith went back to his drawing and thought nothing more of this odd vision. He likened the experience to a random daydream and then promptly forgot about it. The next day he was working again on a Conan page. I was leaning into the paper at close range when in an instant, the off-white surface seemed to dissolve before my eyes, leaving only the wooden drawing board on my lap. Then the board itself also began to disappear, and in its place was a scene, full color and movie-like, of a noisy traffic jam. He saw the scene in great detail, as if he were just above it. He saw, for example, two white trucks, both stalled, all the yellow taxi cabs, told him that he was witnessing a New York City street scene. He even recognized that he was looking through a window above the traffic jam, as he could see his reflection in the glass as he peered through it. All this played out beneath the page before it faded away back into the whiteness of the paper on his drawing board, back on the page, back to Conan and his sexy co-star Jenna. <laughs> Fast forward three years later to New York City. Now he's living in New York, so he was in London. Hmm. Uh, and this is 1973, that magic summer. Smith was now living in the States. Smith was living in Brooklyn and working in the studio of an artist friend named Michael Dorrit and another artist, Charles White III. So there were three artists and an assistant named Carol working in the studio that summer. While the others were out to lunch, Smith dashed off a drawing, left it on Charlie's desk and went back to work. A bit later, he heard his colleagues come back from lunch. So he got to see what they thought of his drawing. As he entered the room, he saw Charlie and Carol standing in front of a sunny window discussing the drawing. Charlie's mustache seemed to blaze in the glare of the light as he exclaimed, They're gonna love it. Carol, all smiles, could only agree. Oh, yeah. In that instant, the present time winked out and I was back in my parents' home three years earlier. Where, of course, he had seen the same scene in what he had thought was just a daydream. Back in 1973 now, he became dizzy from his realization. I experienced a hard shove to my central perception of self, as if my awareness was pushed to the left of what I had hitherto not identified as my center of consciousness, my oneness. A terrific rush of whirling, roaring sounds broke loose as if non-material forces were slamming about in my previously centralized point of being, my dual functioning mind. Basically, it sounds like this time looping back thing is having a, a physical sensation effect in his mind and in his head. Then, like his drawing board three years earlier, the floor to his left just disappeared. And where it was supposed to be, he now saw, quote, a vast whirling mass of gases and billowing clouds of indistinguishable matter, all turning in a circular motion around new forming globes, burning like suns. The crimson vision, quote, red everywhere lasted 30 to 40 seconds, he guesses. Then he was back, looking up at a confused and concerned Charlie and Carol. You, you okay? okay? He wasn't. He was shaking, and he was in shock. He stumbled home. The artist would analyze this double event endlessly over the next years. Who wouldn't, you know? That's pretty mm -hmm. crazy. Indeed, decades. He would finally conclude that the vision of the cosmos may have been an illusion, that is, an imaginative vision, but the uncanny connection of the two events from May of 1970 and June of 1973 definitely was not, not even close. Time had somehow looped back on itself. And this becomes something we see in a theme 
even with Philip K. Dick having a very similar experience, looping back in time to his childhood home, visiting himself. Pretty fascinating. Yes. It's interesting. The visualization of that floor opening up and seeing basically what sounds like, I don't know, cosmic creation beneath the, his- The rushing of the sounds reminds me a lot of out-of-body experiences. Exactly. And yeah, and I didn't get into it at all, but um, Kripal had his own paranormal experience that sort of inspired him to do this book. And it was his experience, given this downloaded information, what led up to it sounds just like what leads up to an out-of-body experience. Yeah. Vi he was vibrating, mm -hmm. um, the sensation going up through the bottom of his feet up through his head. It reminds me of that story of the spirit phone when that girl is talking to her daughter on the other line and there's the raging winds. And yeah, stuff right, like that. exactly. I didn't think about that, but yeah, the, the yeah. whirring. I brought something to the table. Nice work. <laughs> yeah, maybe it's a connection to just that other side, yeah. whatever that is. It does seem to be like loud noises and white noise and like mm -hmm. intense whirring. Vibrating and all that stuff seems to kind of go together. Definitely. All right, I wanted to get into one more experience uh, that. Barry Windsor Smith had as part of his opus experiences. Um, Kripal calls this the black waves of time. So this is Sunday, June 10th. Um, he's back in the studio. He's working on details of a wolf howling at the moon for a Robert E. Howard's poem called Chimeria and preparing for lunch. Suddenly he became really, really tired, and quote, as if the force of gravity had multiplied itself a hundredfold. He fell onto the couch, unable to move, unable to resist whatever force was overtaking him, unable to open his eyelids. He fell into a deep, deep sleep. Now Smith found himself lost in an utter and infinite blackness. There was no linear time in this, quote, perfect nothingness. That part reminds me of some OBs we've heard about. OBs. I mean, near-death experiences where before they have whatever experience they're going to have, there's this sort of retraction of ego and the dissolving of ego and just a black nothingness. Right. But it's like this calming. Just floating in timeless space. Right. That sounds like that to me. But there was this, quote, supernatural calm and the completeness of forever. He eventually recognized all this as a presence, as, quote, embodiment of all time and all place. Once he accepted it as such, this presence shifted dramatically and took a new form, that of dimension. He perceived the fact he was no longer a body. Quote, I had no heart, no lungs, no electrochemical systems pulsing in a red meat factory of materiality. My consciousness was my soul, prevailing existence. Pure transcendent consciousness. Nor was there any clock time. No linear quote before and after. The sense had been replaced by another kind of dimension, the dimension of meaningfulness. As the meaning grew, another form of movement appeared, energy. This energy appeared as an immense black wave moving from a point of origin impossibly far away and expanding exponentially as it approached his sense of self. He understood that, quote, In perceiving this movement, I had perceived light. As this black light broke upon my shore of perception, just in front of me, perhaps a million miles away, I realized that the wave was actually blacker than the ultimate black of the surrounding infinity. And then to his utter confusion came a second wave, blacker than the first, and then a third, and then a fourth, each blacker than the previous, each bringing, quote, uncountable experiences transmigrating time in multidimensional space, the histories of trillions of otherwise unknowable events since the universe spawned consciousness. Each wave contained all the experiences of the previous waves, vested in the depths of all the knowing that exists everywhere, but is as yet unrecognized by the human race, end quote. That's a lot. That's a lot. <laughs> so you could see why this might intimidate somebody. Uh, yeah, to just feel that that's what this is. Right, and that's, that's exactly what happens to Barry at this point. He's realizing that he's immaterial to the cosmic everything. He says that he will always continue to be so immaterial to this, and he just wanted to be back in the city, preferably with his girlfriend, in the bed he knew, you know, curled up at that moment and get away from this intenseness. This Sounds is like going mad. Exactly. Loss of mind. Right. And but this is what's interesting that happens here, this the personification of this this wave, this wave of everything. So he panics in a kind of phantom body. He began to scream and throw himself about in a desperate rage. He wanted back to his goddamn three dimensions. Smith tried to hold on to his humanity and shock himself back into this reality and did so by ranting and raving. It's not real! It's not real! 
This is where it gets interesting. The omnipotent intelligence that was the presence responded by trying to correct his, quote, disorder, but then sadly acknowledged what the frightened little earth creature willed, quote, I have never before or since experienced such a deeply palpable sense of regret as that which pervaded the presence that had journeyed so determinedly to my door of self. (laughs) That was a word. (laughs) Wordiness. First, it was a momentary confusion about my actions, then an adjustment of sorts, then a profoundly pained retreat that accepted my free will to return to my existence as a flesh-bound being. Isn't that fascinating? This consciousness that he was experiencing, right? This all-knowing everything presence there. Presence with a capital P. Right, when Barry couldn't take this anymore and he's trying to like get out of this, he feels this unimaginable regret coming from this presence. Like this presence is regretting. It's like, oh, I should not have bothered this guy. And he went all the way to what he calls his front door of consciousness from whatever trillions of light years or other dimensions to, to him to like, have this process with him. And then he's realizing this little earth creature doesn't want this. So this thing is exuding this regret. He first, he tries to make some adjustments so that he can handle it, but he, he can't do it. It reminds me of the Terrence McKenna trip yeah. sometimes when they're trying to be like, pay attention. Right, don't, exactly. don't, don't give in to, don't give in to the astonishment. Amazement, the exactly. astonishment. We have things to tell you. And then they're like, ah, uh. exactly. And it's that veil again we talked about, you know, they let you go before you go crazy. Yeah. Before you go mad. And again, he's never done drugs. Like this is not part of the thing. And um, there's always the question of schizophrenia, right? which I'll touch on at the end of the episode and the conclusion by the author. But um, so then, you know, it's over and Smith comes back into this world and looks at his watch. It was 3.45 Monday morning. He had been in infinity for 16 hours, earth time. He stumbled back into his nearby apartment, narrowly escaping the threatening knife of two street thugs by running, screaming and acting as if he were crazy. Yes, he was really back in this world. Wait, what? <laughs> so basically after this experience, he's running back to his place, his apartment. After? So this happened outside? This happened, I think it, he was at work, wasn't he? So then, yeah, he had he couldn't just be on the street for 16 no, hours. No, 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 he, was, he crashed on the couch at his studio. Okay, and then he, he after He woke that, up 16 hours okay. later of being in infinity. And then he left and he got chased by- He gets, he gets jumped by two guys. He's like, yeah, I'm back, in, I'm back on earth. <laughs> he starts acting but crazy. But he just acted like he was- in- Insane, yeah. He just acted like he was crazy. But he, didn't he do the same thing when he was in Infinity Land? Oh yeah, I think it was probably an easy callback to do that again because <laughs> he'd just been ranting and raving That's there. That's funny. Yeah, you just let yourself go back to that ending. wild state. Right, what a strange- It reminds me of time looping back on itself in some kind of way. You know, it's funny. I always thought that if I was mugged, like attacked with someone who's just trying to kill me, right? Um- You'd act like I would act person. insane. I mean, I'd cut myself and try to throw blood and say, I am diseased. <laughs> right. Just like, Wah! you know, just be as weird as possible so that they're just like confused and bothered and right. disturbed to want to bother me. I remember seeing a mentalist talk about that. Jeremy oh, does that when them. I chase him. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> I do weird stuff to confuse you. You're very adept at that. But this, this mentalist Thank said you. what he did and what you should do is, especially being accosted by someone who's intoxicated, you say something completely off the wall that doesn't make any sense. Like, oh, your your shirt is bluer than uh, the ocean. Resting toes make the best bedfellows. You're so, <laughs> perfect. I think he said something like, my apartment has too many walls or something. And <laughs> the guy like that was going to beat him up was like, huh? And then just kind of like sat down. And then like he was able to like talk to the guy, but it just broke the, that Confused sort of. Him, yeah. It's a pattern interrupt. Exactly. Yeah. Um, it's kind of like look out behind you, kind of like throw you off what oh, you're yeah. doing, but just more. What's that? Yeah, more confusing. <laughs> <laughs> That'd, That'd be, be so, so great fun. if that worked. Someone's mugging you like, what's that behind you? Look, oh my God. Oldest trick in the book. We were being chased by a bunch of drunk guys who wanted to beat us up for some reason. Um, I won't this? get into the whole story. Okay. Someone cut me off and around a dangerous curve late at night and I honked the horn and he had a buddy behind him who was drunk and pulled up. Anyways, I think I told the story before. But anyways, a chase ensues. I, I was, was driving. Yeah, you were driving. A chase ensues, and then <laughs> there's like a there's a straightaway, and then you can go right and or uh, left. No, the point is, I just I flicked on the turn signal to let my chasers know which way I was going to yeah. go. <laughs> and the guy who was right on my ass, I started to feel that way. He followed, and then I just whipped left, and he went right. That actually, but he, but he just continued to go right. <laughs> he just continued to go yeah. right. Yeah, so That's I lost hilarious. that guy. Hilarious. That's funny. And that I finally worked. got to Randall's house, and he had all your friends Quick out waiting. Thinking, Jeremy. Thanks. It's just hilarious that that actually worked. Look, like, like that worked. They must have been drunk. <laughs> yeah. They're like, look, he's signaling. So we, like, I was gonna give him a heads up. You know, <laughs> we were going like ninety miles per hour too. It was really dangerous. That's and scary. Really funny. That was the one time I wanted a cop to pull me over, just so yeah. I could be like, these guys have a baseball bat. 
And I'm scared. You didn't know what they looked like, did you? Yeah, because they got out of the car initially and walked up to our car and threw a pitcher of beer in the window. We threw it in, at me in the passenger seat. Threw it at Chris yeah. because Chris had said something. So after that happened, I'm just dripping with beer and angry. The guy takes a swing at Chris and misses. And at that point, I slam on the gas. I whip around the f- car that was in front of us because they had blocked us in. I whip around the front car and Chris threw I had all my uh, all the mistake Dairy Queen blizzards and ice cream cones. From when you worked I, there? Yeah, I was taking it to a party because I, I had left work. So I just threw them all out on at the windshield of the car that had been in front of me and just splattered all over them. Oh, and then God. the chase began. Then the chase ensued. So by the time we got to Randall's, everybody was waiting ready. behind Randall's house, like ready to go. I was like, get the guys ready. It's going down. <laughs> I didn't even know you had guys to get ready. I mean, this is a good story. <laughs> All right. Well, to wrap up Barry's experience, I was just going to end it with uh, his idea of what the heart of the problem is, uh, as relayed by Kripal. Uh, the artist finally concludes that for mind to be understood at all, so not brain, but mind, Consciousness must be accepted as an immaterial reality. That is, we must stop confusing mind and brain. He recognizes, of course, that most professional neuroscientists would find such claims ludicrous, but then they have never known what he has known. As for the post-human folks, John, you'll be interested in this, who think we can download consciousness onto computer chips, this all strikes the artist as patently confused and morally appalling, as a gross reduction of human consciousness, quote, to digital codes in the control of cold-blooded mechanists. Mm-hmm. It's basically saying like, yeah, that we've talked about that before. That yeah. idea is just, is just insane. I mean, well, I don't know if it's insane or not. I think it's horribly dangerous and a terrible idea. But. Well, I think his point about it being confused, I would agree with because I don't think it's something that you could do in the first place. It's a very reductionist idea. But, but again, yeah, you're right. I mean, but he's saying like, it's also confused and morally appalling because it's, yeah, it reduces the idea of con- human consciousness. It sounds like a prison, like an eternal prison. Right. Well, it's, it's for people that believe that there's nothing after this. Materialists. Right, you know? or there's something that they don't want to go to because of their actions. That could be. Well, they also karmic th- actions. Right. Maybe not even a heaven or hell, but just like you've Some sort done of horrible things your whole life punishment. and they know that if they have to face those karmic actions, so they're trying to escape it. Yeah. Well, the transhumanists and the technocrats, whether or not they believe that, like they're trying to escape a potential judgment or mm-hmm. whether they believe there's nothing. Right. The idea that you can copy paste consciousness by basically compiling all recorded memories and patterns and habits and you know the brain the chemistry right. like there's but is there more to it than that yeah exactly if you just do that and you die and then they copy paste you are you still the same thinking person is that you anymore you're gone but this is a copy of yeah, your it sounds like a copy copy of the way that you think copy of what you remember so you could create a machine kind of thing that would have all your memories but it wouldn't be you anymore right i mean Unless they have more, plan. unless they have a soul trap gem or something. <laughs> I mean, and I don't know what is that sort of how the transhumanist ideas work. So far, as from what far I as, understand, yeah. they just copy every experience you've had. The, every... I think the basic idea for again, it would be interesting to look into this, but I think that you are your memories. Right. You compile all that information, and if you can map that so thoroughly, um, your experiences, whatever that makes you who you are, you could essentially create paste yourself into another... I mean, another... If, if you believe that there's no such thing as a soul, that makes sense. Yeah. Or a consciousness outside of the material. Right. But how do you... Say you die, you have to experience death to do that. How does recreating a, a mimic of yeah. those memories, how does that bring your experience into this new body? Well... Your experience would end and it would create this new thing like you. Maybe you have to do it before you die. But still, how would hmm. you get... A, well, that's what they think they're trying to figure out. If there's a way to... Like actual consciousness, not a copy. Well... They think that maybe consciousness is that copy. You right. know, there's, I mean, I don't think anyone can say for sure one way or another unless they've experienced death or a near death experience. I mean, I don't believe that. I mean, it makes sense to me if you were trying to make a copy so that then you could possess that copy. Right. Possess that circuitry that's been created to replicate your synapses. No, I know what you're saying. It's like to capture that awareness. We believe there's more to the body than just all the mm-hmm. experiences, like there's a soul. Yeah, and you need that passenger, that consciousness soul passenger to move from right. that. Otherwise it's not you. Otherwise you're you're gone and right. there's just a copy with all your memories. Yeah, yeah. that's a big paradox with Which Star Trek. Which could be inhabited by a demon. That's true, <laughs> absolutely true. That's the paradox with Star Trek and the transporter. Because technically the transporter, what it does if you look at the fiction of Star Trek, decompiles all your molecules. It breaks and, you down and rebuilds you somewhere else. So technically... You die, and a copy of you is made. 
mm-hmm. which is interesting. Because when you're watching Star Trek, you don't think about that. Every time Riker goes from the Enterprise down to a planet or something, it's a new Riker. Yeah, does his consciousness continue with him? Yeah, it would have to. There was a great episode where uh, there was a fail during the transporting onto a oh, ship or something, crazy. and it makes it ends up making a copy of him. And then there's two Rikers. Oh, is that true? Yeah, it was a great episode. I remember there was an- It's ep- to go like live another life. <laughs> there's a really, really interesting episode in, uh, oh, was it Voyager? Where Neelix and Tuvok, this Vulcan guy and this other alien guy- they're, This is they're super both, interesting. It, well, it's, but it asks an interesting question. So like these two crew members, they're different species. They transport down to the planet or whatever. They come back, they're accidentally combined into one entity, one person. Oh, that's right. What was their name? Uh, two, two, uh, Tulix or Neovok or something? I don't know. <laughs> Anyways, it's, it, was, it was basically a new- Entity. Entity with a different- Shared consciousness they, kind of. Basically, the, I don't know if it was immediate or after trying to figure out how to extract them from this one new entity, it became its own person. Mm-hmm. And then the question was, if we separate them back, we're essentially killing this new life form. Security to the bridge. Commander, you gotta stand by and do nothing while she commits murder. My friends. Doesn't anyone see that this is wrong? I'm sorry, Captain, but I cannot perform the surgical separation. I am a physician, and a physician must do no harm. I will not take Mr. Tuvik's life against his will. Very well, Doctor. Please step aside. Energizing. Yeah, Star Trek's good for asking interesting questions like well, that. And that's what this is all about, is it's how people relate paranormal concepts into pop culture. Right. Um, so it, it really works well. And to bring it back in for our final account here, our final discussion. Oh, finally, Philip K. Finally, Philip K. Dick. And man, we could- Are we saving the best for last? Well, you tell me. It's definitely, the, I think, the most remarkable in that he's just so, such a notable figure mm-hmm. in fiction. And he had an extreme life. Fascinating guy. His twin sister died super young, had a terrible relationship with his mother, very strange relationship. Father left. A lot Psychological problem, a lot of trauma, psychiatric issues, a lot of drug use. Genius writer, though. But in the summer of 1973, this takes place just a few months after the last guy we were talking about. Another sort of encounter with some advanced consciousness, which he called Vallis. And according to Dick, he underwent a transformation. Vallis means something? Vallis stands for, it's an acronym for Vast Active Living Intelligence System. He said that, you know, in his own precise terms, quote, it resynthesized or reprogrammed him by a pink beam emanating from a vast superconsciousness, which was Vallis. Vallis, was this, I always pictured it as like a craft floating in space. Yeah, that's him. kind of what, it reminds me of kind of the, the Black Knight right. kind of concept. Black Knight satellite. But this was real. This was a real thing that happened to him. And as this light beamed this information into his head, he realized that it it was beaming all the energies of all of his books into him. I just think it's interesting, like if you were this super intelligence and you knew he was a writer, what a great way to like get whatever information you want. Exactly. And what what is it about this character, Philip K. Dick, who is a super unique individual with from his life experience and everything else, Mm -hmm. his genius maybe the perfect person. And one thing that gets talked about is the idea that because he had some psychiatric issues and because he had this propensity for drug use and hallucinogenics, did this remove some of the barriers? Exactly. To allow something like this to happen. That's always sort of the back and forth question. So this Vallis entity spoke Greek, Hebrew, Sanskrit. It flooded his brain with the history, according to him, and information of of all the religions, particularly ancient religions of Egypt, India, Persia, Greece, and Rome. And through this experience, he realizes that his future work, especially the series with Vallis, it flowed directly through this conscious being, external, vast intelligence. So yeah, exactly what you were saying, John. And it it does this sort of thing where it decodes all of his previous work and he realizes that it it's sort of this time travel mm-hmm. where everything he had written was for a reason. And he started to understand what those things were that he was writing that maybe he didn't quite understand before. It's interesting. It's where it says um, this light or this all-knowing informational source had hid itself in and as the material virtual world. 
Yeah. So like it was maybe injected into religions and languages and throughout history. And so he's getting a direct line from the right. thing that's been here all along, but in a more, you know, intense mind piercing kind well, of way. In, in very individualistic to him, to Philip K. Dick. Right. Is this connected to Dick's, uh, the, you know, one of our very first episodes, which might be archived now, we played a quote from him coming out at a conference and saying he believed that this world was a simulation. You know what I'm talking yeah, about? That yeah, yeah. It's, it's all related to this idea. Was like, that information maybe given to him by Vallis? Uh, maybe. I don't That's remember. I don't remember the chronology of that. Maybe we'll, maybe we'll drop that quote. Sure. I, in my stories and novels, often write about counterfeit worlds. At no time did I have a theoretical or conscious explanation for my preoccupation with these pluriform pseudo worlds. But now I think I understand. You are free to believe me or to disbelieve, but please take my word on it that I am not joking. This is very serious, a matter of importance. It's a common theme in my writing that a dark-haired girl shows up at the door of the protagonist and tells him that his world is delusional, that there's something false about it. Well, this did finally happen to me. I even knew that her hair would be black. I had an actual complete sense of what she would look like and what she would say. She did appear, she was a total stranger, and she did inform me of this fact. Some of my fictional works were in a literal sense true. At that time, I had no idea what I was seeing. It resembled nothing that I had ever heard described. It resembled plasmic energy. It had colors. It moved fast. It collected and then dispersed. But what it was, what he was, I am not sure even now. I wrote out these dreams in novel after novel, story after story. I'm going to be very candid with you. I wrote based on fragmentary residual memories of such a horrid slave state world. We are living in a computer programmed reality and the only clue we have to it is when some variable is changed. Deja vu. Such an impression is a clue that at some past time point a variable was changed and that because of this an alternative world branched off. People claim to remember past lives, I claim to remember a different, very different present life. I know of no one who has ever made this claim before, but I rather suspect that my experience is not unique. What perhaps is unique is the fact that I am willing to talk about it. Talk about it. There's so much to get in with Philip K. Dick, and the the one thing I'll I'll wrap up with here, I know it's kind of brief with Vallis, but he had this experience with this woman. You know, that pink light gave Dick this reinterpreted reinterpretation of all of his earlier works. And Vallis became kind of the code book where you could break down that 10 volume meta novel of all of his work. They could all be understood now, according to Philip K. Dick, but only retroactively. It was finally the future that explained the past. Time had looped back on itself again. And this is where we get that experience he has with this woman, which is life changing for him. On February 20th, 1974, the doorbell rang at Dick's apartment in Fullerton, California. The author was feeling a bit woozy from some sodium pentothal he had been given at the dentist's office for an oral surgery to remove two impacted wisdom teeth. A young woman was at the door. She was delivering a packet of Darvon for the pain. Dick was struck by her dark hair, her eyes and her beauty. He was also attracted to her golden necklace, which featured the fish sign used by the early Christians as a symbol for Christ. This golden symbol that gleamed in the sun somehow triggered a two-month series of remarkable experiences in the author, including various memories of past lives. Dick explains this, quote, The golden fish sign causes you to remember. Remember what? This is Gnostic, your celestial origins. This has to do with the DNA because the memory is located in the DNA, the phylogenetic memory. You remember your real nature, which is to say origins from the stars, the Gnostic Gnosis. You are here in this world in a throne condition, but you are not of this world. Oh, that's very biblical. Right, that rings familiar, doesn't it? In this world, but not of it. But not a of throne it. condition, that's an interesting way to say that. Yeah. 
you're put here and then trying to remember what we are. Even right. if you think about the idea of the throwing. Maybe it was choice. I mean, if you t- go back to the yeah. idea of the creation of humanity, if you believe in a God and that we exist here so that God has divided himself so that he can know himself through us, you know, that's one perspective on it, that we are thrown here and we are purposely forgetful of where we came from so that we can spend our existence rediscovering that. Well, and that's the Gnostic idea. Or to grow, because you can't have growth without hardships. Exactly. And that, that's the Gnostic idea is that the final point of evolution, of, of spiritual evolution, is the breaking down of that barrier where God knows himself through us to a point where the human mind is fully evolved into this divine being. Just like the Bodo and Cantato. Hakuna Matata? What a wonderful phrase. This is a uh, synchronicity connecting to the expansion. The Bodo Encantado is a sexy uh, man dolphin. <laughs> How does this relate to that? Because he, when he leaves the dark Amazon river to go to the parties of Brazil to dance with the women, he sometimes will spend his time there in an effort to experience, because he comes from Encanta, which is like a land of perfectness, essentially mystical watery land and so he wants the, he's drawn to the the struggle of human existence mm-hmm. and so he transforms into a sexy human man he has to wear a hat because he has a blowhole it's the only thing that doesn't, sh- it doesn't change out of his shape shifting <laughs> uh, and he'll impregnate the ladies and dance with them and feel what it is to be human before escaping back into the, the mm. rivers of Brazil <laughs> I am excited for this expansion it's definitely going to be a True hard story turn. yeah interesting um one day we'll do a full episode on Dick because there's so much to get into with his experiences and his philosophy. But basically, he has these experiences he, through this time. He has all these paranormal experiences. He experiences past lives in Rome uh, where he was persecuted Christian. There was a time in 1974 where the Roman world was overlaid with his, the city he was living in at the time um, in California. What? And uh, yeah, he said it was a, sh- a sort of experience that led him to write two kinds of time, more or less, just like Barry Windsor, where this sort of linear straight line of time, and then and we won't get into his concepts of time because it's a whole other thing right now, but I basically want to sum it up by saying in that relation to that traveling back. In 1977 interview, Dick reported a series of dreams that bear a remarkable similarity to Windsor Smith's time loop experience. And for two years, Dick explained he had been having the same dream of being back in a house he was living in in around 1951. Quote, I have a strange feeling that back then in 1951 to 52, I saw my future self, that I crashed backwards as my future self through one of my dreams, now of that house, going back there and seeing myself again. That would be the kind of stuff I would write as a fantasy in the early 50s. So just a complete comparative tie-in to the other illustrator's the experience. Time is weird. Yeah. And then the, the, the paradoxes of, of yeah. like that, like would you have written in the first place? You so know, it's like there's no such thing as time. Well, that's kind of the idea is that there's, and each of these people have a sort of a little bit different view, but both two sorts of time. It's one almost was, like there's time in this, the physical world, but mm-hmm. there's an outside time. Exactly. That makes, or there's no, there's an outside reality where there's no time. That right. would make more sense. Well, that's, that's yeah, kind we of are, what they all describe. We experience time linearly, linearly. Because we have to. In reality, it's the, the idea is that it happens all at once. Right. That's maybe how you can loop right. or hop or whatever. But not necessarily, though. I mean, if there's an outside, it's weird. It's a paradox because there's a, an outside existence with no time, and then there's the linear time. But mm-hmm. it is weird. It's weird. It's, it's, well, we could do a whole episode yeah. on that. Some of it is uh, maybe not no time outside, but the rules. It's a it's a dimension unto itself, so you can move within it, and it's not a, it's not before and after outside. There might be some sort of movement chronologically in some viewpoints of this outside time, but it's not a fixed straight path like we experience but we have to experience it this way that's the only way we can get through our mortal life you know Mm -hmm. the process of learning and struggling and exactly and just to finish out this whole thing because the one thing people are going to point out when it comes to especially philip k dick was his psychotic experiences Mm -hmm. uh his self-described at least and his what if psychotic is just finding out the truth that's a that's a question for sure and that's one of the things that the author brings up here you know, is it the chicken or the egg kind of thing? Mm-hmm. Yeah, same with the, the drugs um, in particular. So I'll just, I'll finish by touching on this. Reductionism and dismissal are always the easiest ways out of the profound challenge that an author like Dick or Windsor Smith poses to us. It would be easy, of course, to assert that a sci-fi author like Dick is not, quote, really religious, that he is pretending a revelation that he does not in fact possess, that his vast work 
was the result of a schizophrenic episode or a temporal lobe epilepsy and a subsequent paranoia and hypergraphia or, quote, manic writing. In some ways, such diagnoses fit the bill, as Sutton has shown in detail, which was his biographer. And indeed, Dick was obviously suffering seriously and deeply in other ways. However, they missed the mark and widely. Dick, after all, experienced on February 3rd, 1974, was profoundly healing as an ending of the gulf that separated him from the world as a repair. So his experience he described as being a repair, not a psychotic episode that caused damage, more damage to him. Um, easy phrases then like, quote, schizophrenic episode or, quote, temporal lobe epilepsy finally mislead in their false sense of full explanation. In truth, there is no full explanation here. As such neurological states could be the necessary biological conditions or catalysts as opposed to the materialist causes of such spiritual inrushes. In short, a correlation is not a cause and may in the end be a catalyst of something entirely different, which is exactly what you were saying, John. There is also, of course, the very common, and this gets into the drug idea with Philip K. Dick, quote, drug reading. However, Dick's drug-taking habits, like his possible temporal lobe seizures, may have indeed played key psychological roles in his creativity and mystical experiences, and this precisely to the extent that they rendered his psyche more porous to the metaphysical dimensions he entered so dramatically. Again, like, was is this what removes the screen, potentially? Right. And at the very end, I'll just say, um, uh, put differently, the drugs may have well dissolved his ego here and there. And this may have been precisely what let Vallis in, like what we talked about. But it does not follow that Vallis was a product of the drugs. Let me put it bluntly. It is one thing to acknowledge that John Doe left his body because his Toyota Camry slammed into an oak tree at 70 miles an hour in a blizzard. It is quite another to claim that the immortality of the soul he knew with certainty in that state can be reduced to the oak tree, the smashed Camry, the blizzard, or even his traumatized brain. So too with mental illness or madness. Mad people suffer horribly, and I have absolutely no desire to romanticize mental illness, but as we have known at least since the time of Plato, mad people are sometimes also gifted people with exceptionally porous egos and so very special powers of seeing and being. Interesting, yeah. I think yeah. it's a good way to put it, you know? Especially in a world where people tend to just go along with one, the herd mentality sort of thing. Yeah. So if someone's so diametrically opposed to those ideas or, you know what I'm trying to way say? Way of being. Yeah, you're going to go right to these explanations of material causes like drugs, schizophrenia, mm -hmm. frontal lobe. Yeah, it's much easier episodes. to dismiss it. Exactly. And there are times where sometimes it's both because like you yeah. said, the ego is more porous and you are a little mad. Uh, so you may experience the negative sides of being mad, the reality of the, the mental illness, but also that might allow you to understand a little more deeply about certain things of reality. Exactly. And that's, I mean, this whole book is about this, the dichotomy of all of these things. Uh, which makes it such a good read. And also for all you superhero comics fans and comic history fans and science fiction fans, the first 250 pages of this book, it dives into the paranormal, but also a lot of really interesting history behind the writers of Superman, oh, Batman, Spider-Man. Mutants and mystics. Exactly. Because comic and books, mutants, and then mystics. Oh, okay. It goes deep into the X-Men and the lore and how that relates to the paranormal synchronicity. There's so much in this book. Mystics and Mutants, Science Fiction, Superhero Comics, and the Paranormal by Jeffrey J. Kripal. I'm sure you get multiple episodes out of that book. Oh, for sure. We'll, yeah. we'll definitely be retouching on his stuff here. Quick question, Philip K. Dick. I thought that he had uh, experienced the lady from Blade Runner visit him. Uh, I don't know. Is that true? I know there was a character. That might have been the woman who brought him his drugs. That might have been kind of the same story. Um, she looked just like he imagined her. Yeah. Well, I will say, I will finish it off with this, and I was going to say this in the very beginning. He has a quote here about experiencing a character that he would later write. Quote, It is an eerie experience to write something into a novel, believing it is pure fiction, and to learn later on, perhaps years later, that it is true. And that's Philip K. Dick on meeting a woman named Kathy at the end of 1970 who fit, in fantastic detail, a character named Kathy whom he had, quote, invented a few months earlier. Interesting. Yeah. Lots to think about. Definitely. Yeah. Well, guys, we hope you like this episode. If you're ready for some sea action, some mermaid fun time. Head on over to the hole. Yeah. Beliefhole.com. Definitely a hard left turn from this. I'm kind of excited, though, to get back into the material just, just a little bit. My brain is a little... It gives you a little bit of an uneasy feeling the more you... It's like what uh, 
Windsor Smith experience when he was out with these lapping waves of eternity. Right. You get that feeling when you're talking about it. Sometimes you want to get back to your podcast studio and talk about mermaids. Well, there's definitely some interesting mystical stuff there too. But yeah, not as far as like reality shifting, mind bending, right? Get off the roller coaster ride type deal. What am I trying to conceptualize like forever in time? Right. Well, guys. Oh, and by the way, quick shout out to Joe. Joe. Yay! Joe. Tarnia's daughter. Yes. Special hello to you. Well, hello, hello. Thank you so much for listening. And Tarnia, you've been awesome. You've been here since the beginning. And some thank yous to some new uh, expansion members and patrons. Oh, do we have music or do you want, do we just, I feel like if whenever 100 years from now John dies, we should play this music as people go, walk up to the coffin viewing. They play this music. Up, uh, <laughs> there it goes. <laughs> thank you too. Magdalene Johnson. Hey, Magdalene. Welcome. We love you. Obi-Wan Wasabi. Ooh, hot. Clever name. Clever girl. <laughs> what? Clever. Cle- clever girl. From Jurassic Park? Yeah. Where did that come from? Because I said clever name. Oh. <laughs> Keep up. <laughs> Doing jokes off your own jokes. Okay. <laughs> Stacy Kowalski. Welcome, Stacy. Thank you for joining the hole. Spencer No. Spencer, Spencer Noel. Get in the hole, Noel. Get Christmassy with us, my Happy friend. Happy holidays to you, Spencer. Don Pauling. Welcome to the hole. Hey, Don. Welcome. What's up? The sun has risen. Thank you to Jimmy the Bullet Atkins. Ooh, Ow! Fire! Yikes! <laughs> Gunshots. The Bullet. I want to know where you got that name. Or do I? Welcome to Rachel, Rachel Goodson. Goodson. For some better, better be good. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Get out of here. Welcome to be here. Bye. Welcome to be here. Uh, <laughs> thank you. I had nothing to drink today. It's been a long episode. Welcome to be here, yeah. Quentin Turk. <laughs> Welcome, Quentin Tuek. 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 Yeah. Welcome, Quentin. Interesting name. I like it. We have a lot of Quintins. Hello, hello, Tanya Fraley. 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 Tanya Fraley. Welcome to the hey, hole. Hey, Tanya. Thanks hey. for being here. The hey, Tom, Tom. All right. Welcome to Connor Quigley. Hey, that is Connor. a name. Get Squiggly with Connor Quigley. Welcome, <laughs> my friend. <laughs> yes. Oh, welcome to Fancy Crafts. Right. Fancy Crafts. Thanks, Learn to draw. Buddy. Check them out on YouTube. Thank you, Fancy Crafts. Welcome to Nate Dog. Right. Nate Dog. With Warren G. <laughs> Mount up. <laughs> Welcome to Mallory Durego. Yeah. Welcome, Mallory Durego. Hi, Mallory. Thanks for, oh, I think she's re- real recent. Just, I remember seeing her name the other day. Oh, well, it's good to have Welcome. her. Welcome. Yeah. There it is. Michelle Garcia. Welcome in. Hi, Michelle. Thanks for being here. We appreciate you. Thank you to Cassidy Dean. Yes. She's the Dean of Ca- University Cassidy. Okie dokie. <laughs> Sorry. That might be the worst one ever. <laughs> worst joke. We love you, Cassie. Uh, Thanks. Plunging deeper into the hole is Sophia Sa- Sabo. 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 Well, cool name. Where's well, your... That's interesting. Welcome in, Sophia. Sorry we butcher your names. Yeah. Sorry, guys. Your names are interesting and hard for us. Congratulations to... <laughs> Sarah Vallejo. <laughs> Congratulations. Congratulations. You are a member. <laughs> and thank you for being here. Yeah. Welcome to Cindy M. Cindy M. Hi, Cindy. What? Mm-mm, good. Yum. Amanda Gothier, welcome to the hole. Welcome in, Amanda. Welcome. Good to see your face. Enjoy the mermaid episode. Yes. yes. Coming up. <laughs> uh, welcome to Ashlyn Elizabeth. Welcome, Ashlyn. Hey, Ashlyn. Thanks for being here. We appreciate you. Hello, Shelly Terry. Shelly Terry. Ooh, two first names. That's when it gets interesting. I love two first names. Me too. Or two last names. Or two like last Mary names. Shelley's Frankenstein. Yes! Sure. Okay. As an example. Deb D, welcome in. Deb well, D. Welcome to the expansion, Deb, Deb D. D. Deb D. Deb D. Deb D. <laughs> Trevor Thibodeau. Thibodeau. I no, it's Doe. Is it yeah. Thibodeau? Yeah. Trevor Thibodeau. I think he was a patron at one point. Oh, oh it's expansion now. Welcome nice. in, Trevor. Welcome. Thanks for coming over. Sounds French, maybe. I like that name. Canadian to be. Hey. Welcome to Thom. <laughs> I think it's Tom. Oh, Tom. Buddy. Welcome to Tom. <laughs> Probably the first time he's heard that, though. Yeah. Tom. Tom. Traditional spelling. Thank you for joining the hole. Good to have you here, my friend. What if he's like, no, it's Thom? <laughs> <laughs> it's like everyone gets it wrong, but it's actually Thom. That's what I go by. Laurie. Chad Anderson. Welcome, Chad. Welcome to the hole. <laughs> TJ. TJ. What's up, my friend? Welcome to the expansion. Yes. Lisa D. Hall. Lisa welcome D. Hall. In. Walk down your hall and welcome to Lisa. Sure. Laurie. That's weird. The hall to We're the not hole. getting a lot of last names that allude to like visual stuff. Alexis Burbank, pull up your ship, avoid the mermaids, and bank it right on the shore. <laughs> Alexis. <laughs> Welcome. Welcome. It's Timothy Silcox. Silcox. That's a good name. That feels good coming out. Silcox. Silcox. Silky Ox. Super. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> Cow. Welcome, Tiffany. Welcome to Kim Olsen. All right, Kim. 
Good to have you here. Expansion and a patron. Thanks, Kim. That yeah. might be an accident. That might be welcome. an accident, but welcome. <laughs> welcome both times. Thank you for being a member. <laughs> Petros, welcome in. Oh, welcome, Petros. Hello, Petros. Wonderful. You are welcome in the hole. Welcome, my friend. Sure. Carol Hearn. Welcome. welcome, Carol Hearn. Hi, Carol. We heard what you have to say, and we like it. We heard it. <laughs> yes. Turn it up. Arthur Gatz, welcome to the hole. Welcome, welcome in, Arthur. King Arthur would be proud for you to have his name. Absolutely. Kristen Landry, doing your laundry with uh, Kristen Landry. I was going to say laundry thing. <laughs> I was going to say laundry. <laughs> this is the cheesiest. Okay. Yeah, these are pretty bad. But thank you, Kristen. We really do appreciate yes. it. Yes. And that's it. We are that's done. it. We've caught up to the thank yous. So thank you guys so much. If you made it through that, you deserve a medal. Super. Yes, you do. <laughs> and a sound effect. You were awesome. You were awesome. Well, thank you guys you for awesome. joining the whole, joining the expansion. This is what is going to make us uh, allow to do this Enjoy the extra long episode. Jeez. Yeah, it was a good one. But yeah, we do really appreciate you guys, all your support. Hope you guys enjoy the extra episodes, extra content over the expansion. If you're not a member, go to Bleeful.com, click on the big red join the expansion button. It's a great time in there. We're about to do an episode on uh, Merfolk. And yeah. Strangers if you're new to here in the show, um, feel free to share your experiences with us. Yep. That's also available on the website. If you're listening on YouTube, hit that thumbs up button because that, oh, yeah. that helps the algorithm. Or the subscribe too. Well, both. You know, we don't get a ton of love on YouTube. So anything you can do to help us would be awesome. Aww. Yeah. Made for video and we are audio. So it's a little, yeah. little difficult. But to we do have live streams. So we do. We need to do videos. more of those. We're going to do more. We will. All right, guys. Well, we hope you enjoyed this episode on the incredible and outrageous experiences from fiction authors. Those of you that are expansion members, swim on over to the expansion and get briny with us in the deep seas briny. and the mysteries. Do it. I dare you. Merfolk and ocean things. Or you'll walk the plank. Yeah. That was a pirate joke. All right, guys. The rest of you, we will see you next time on Believe, Believe Hole. Hole. I guess that's a thing now. Yeah. <laughs> it's been a thing for a while. For a while. Oh,